You're listening to the Classic Gamers Guild Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Classic Gamers Guild Podcast. I am here with Anna today. How are you doing, Anna? I'm pretty darn good. How are you, Rick? Doing all right. Thank you very much. And our guest this week is somebody I've been wanting to have on the show since the show pretty much started. And finally, the curse has been broken, and it is my pleasure to welcome Stephen Alexander from Infamous Quests, the developer behind Quest for Infamy, Order of the Thorn, and the upcoming Frog Sheen. How are you doing today, Steve? I am absolutely wonderful, and thank you for having me. Thank you for being on the show. Sorry it took so long. I know we've been in talks for like a year, and... <laughs> Something would always come up. There's, there, I, I always called it the infamous curse because I just, right. for whatever reason, anytime we set a date for you to come on, something would happen and prevent it. Well, you know, literally all I got is time. So, you know, I, I'm just, I'm just glad we did it. You know, I mean, yeah. who cares about how long it took? It just matters that we're here now together. Well, I'm very glad you feel that way. So let's start this off from the beginning. You've uh, you've been a game dev for quite a few years now, but where did it all start? How did you? Uh, what made you decide to become a game dev? Well, you know, it's it's funny. Um, uh, when I was a kid, I you know I, I grew up with uh, you know uh, computers all around me. When I was uh, younger, my uncle was really into computers, so he had like stuff like TRS eighties and um, Commodore Vic twenties, and then the Commodore sixty four at his house. And uh, his his son, my cousin, uh, Connor, uh, he and I were really close. And uh, so we were always doing that kind of stuff together. And they had a PC, you know, at first. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, you know, Connor and I would play games all the time. But we also learned how to program uh, in BASIC at the time. And, uh, and then when I was in school, you know, all they had all kinds of Apple II computers, you know, because I... Mm-hmm. I grew up in the in the eighties and the uh, early nineties, and uh, uh, you know I learned I taught myself how to program Basic, and they taught us this uh, visual programming language called Logo. I don't know if you guys ever used Logo. Not Logo, no, never even heard of it. Well, yeah, Logo was really big when I was younger. It, um, it featured what they called the turtle, which was basically just a triangle, and you would type in commands. And it would draw lines based on your commands. And, um, you know, it seems simple at first, but you could get into more complex equations and you could get it to do, you know, uh, you know, loops and, or, you know, for and then and while and when kind of loops. And you could draw all kinds of crazy geometric things. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and it taught you, you know, structure and everything like that. So for years, I, I kind of made like, little basic programs and um you know connor and i we would often play sierra games together like that was like mm-hmm. our thing and um uh, so i started trying to program you know adventure games uh when i was about 11 or 12 like a, like i made this one uh that was like it was a total rip off of mystery house mm-hmm. it was like you, you had to ex- you know explore a haunted house but like i created all the rooms and i drew all the graphics and basic and you could there was a parser and you could enter in commands and, you know, I thought it was really cool that I could not only, you know, have people respond to commands, but like we also put tons of Easter eggs in there. So if you type mm. like, you know, naughty words or something like that, there was responses <laughs> and we were like, <laughs> so, you know, and, um, I, kind of, I kind of did that stuff, uh, you know, all, all growing up. And of course, you know, I mean, I, I played lots of PC games growing up and uh, the Atari 2600 was the first console I owned. And then I had an Atari 7800, then a Nintendo Entertainment System, and then a Super Nintendo. And so like, you know, those were those were big. You know, if I wasn't PC gaming, I was playing my consoles. I, I, I did all that. And I used to draw up in my notebooks at school and in the margins of my homework, you know, I would draw up like, pictures and characters for like video games that I wanted to do. And, and um, then I, I took a programming course in high school. Uh, I think it was 10th grade. Uh, I was like uh, 15 or 16. And um, I had this teacher there that just like, he just hated me for some reason. Like <laughs> he did. He just did not like me. He thought I was, you know, a, a snot nosed punk and that I had no respect for the, 
the majesty and, and glory of computer programming and that the, <laughs> that all my code was was terrible and that i i could it, by the time i took the class i i could run circles around him and the rest of the class but it wasn't the way that he liked it so like he would constantly give me bad grades and he just really put a bad taste in my mouth for programming oh he was threatened by you yeah so i kind of stopped and i didn't do oh. it for years and uh then uh you know, I uh, I got sick with kidney failure at the end of 2002, and you know my kidneys failed, and I went on dialysis, and my whole life changed. Uh, you know, before that, I was uh, I was working as a uh, a musician. I was touring with my band and and, and playing gigs, and you know, and uh, I was doing all that, and uh, that just you know that stopped. <laughs> Right. And I had a lot of free time on my hands. And uh, on the internet, I discovered Adventure Game Studio, AGS. And I was mm. like, oh, my God. This lets me make, like, Sierra games like I love. I was like, this is the coolest thing. So, like, I immediately started making games with AGS. And uh, on the AGS forums uh, and uh, on uh, the forums for this group called Tierra, who later became AGDI and remade King's Quest 1 and 2, uh, I met. Clytus, uh, who is Sean Mills from Australia, my partner in all this. And um, mm. we developed a friendship and we decided we were going to start making games together. And, uh, you know, that was 2003. That was the first year I was on dialysis. Uh, I had a lot of free time on my hands. And, uh, yeah, and it started from there. And uh, we joked about, you know, wanting to make like a, a game where instead of playing as the hero, because we loved Heroes Quest, you know, that was like mm. our game, Quest for Glory. And uh, But we were like, what if we played as a villain? And we, we crafted up this idea for a game called Quest for Infamy. And at the time, it was like much different than the game we ended up releasing. You know, this was like, at the first, it was all just about mayhem and chaos and we quickly learned that like that's not really a game <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so that's where we started right there uh, 2003 uh forums on the internet and adventure game studio and tiara who later became agdi just two guys living on different sides of the world who mm -hmm. found out that we had a lot in common so and I'm guessing you must have an even bigger team now. Do you have other people from other parts of the world working with you virtually? Oh, yes. Yeah. Everybody, uh, Infamous Quest comes from all over the world. That's what's kind of cool about our little group. You know, we have people from the United States. We have people from Canada. We have people from Central America, South America, uh, the, uh, South Africa, the African continent. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. A couple from, um, you know, people uh, from the you know, uh, northern, northern Africa area, you know, of course, Europe, that little place, got, got a few <laughs> people from there and, and, uh, uh, you know, Britain and, uh, uh, Russia. Yeah. I, several of the guys on the team are Russians. Oh, and wow. Fabulous. Wow. And, you know, so, uh, sounds like your so team's it, definitely grown over the years. Yeah. You know, well, like the, that's the thing is, you know, we started small we started with Sean and I, and we mm. didn't know Jack. You know, like mm -hmm. we couldn't make graphics and we had to learn how to program things on our own. So like our first games looked awful. But, you know, what we did was we just kept going. Mm -hmm. And like that's where a lot of that's where a lot of, you know, indie developers and young teams on games fail. You know, you, you get the initial excitement and it's all crazy, but they, they just they stop after a while where, you know, you just got to keep going. And that's what we did. And like, you know, people laughed at us at first and like, we were like, Oh yeah, we're, you know, we're going to do this and that. And like, people were like, yeah, right. And we would, we would see people who did like art that we liked and we would be like, do you want to come and work on this project with us? And like, no, you know, noobs get out of here. Mm -hmm. But we didn't give up. And I think that's what, you know, really, really did it. And then over the years, you know, people started being like, Oh yeah, you know, I can, I can help with this, you know, because, we initially started, like I said, trying to make off a game, you know, like Quest for Infamy. We were like, you know, we realized we were wo you know, wo woefully unprepared for it. And um, so that's how we decided to get into remaking King's Quest 3. Sean said, you know, I think it'd be a good idea. He's like, I've been working on this a little bit to, like, you know, improve my skills on AGS. He's like, what? You know, because at the time, you know, AGDI said they weren't making it. And we were like, you know what? We should, we should do it. We could do this. So we started to. And uh, 
it started out small and uh, people just started joining in with us when they saw that we really had something we were really doing something and by the end of it you know we had a a, a pretty decent sized crew of people from all over the world you know doing graphics and music and voices and you know it's it, it, it's crazy it's you know, mm -hmm. just like the amount of work that went into it and uh, we ended up releasing that in 2006. So is uh, mm -hmm. King's Quest 3 the first one you guys worked on? Yep, that's the first game that we worked on and released. We had an earlier version of Quest for Infamy that was about four or five rooms and, and there was just really there wasn't much in it. Mm -hmm. So but uh yeah, King's Quest 3 was the first big project and you know we did it. You know like seriously against all odds because in the the span while well, we did King's Quest 3 I was on dialysis. I got my first kidney transplant and, you know, we kept on working. And then my first kidney transplant got damaged in a follow-up surgery. And I was in the hospital for months. Oh no. And, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then it never worked quite right after that. And then that kidney was slowly failing over the the years while we were making it. It well, as a matter of fact, the, the kidney failed at the uh, end of 2006 and we released the game in, I think like summer of 2006. Oh, kind of hard to celebrate. Jeez. Hard times. So, you know, I had to deal with a failing kidney and everything uh, during all of that. But, you know, it was a great escape for it. And it was, you know, like, I can't properly express, like, my love for Sierra games. Like, mm. they're an old friend, you know, mm. like, those boxes, you know, I don't have any Sierra game boxes anymore. I lost all of mine years ago. Um, I was kind of, I was homeless for a few years, <laughs> right? So, uh, I lost a lot of my possessions and, um, except my guitars got kept them, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, I lost a lot of my, my stuff. And, uh, and so, you know, anytime I see those boxes, it just brings back memories. And it wasn't just, you know, like my house, it was my cousin's house. It was my other cousins. It was my friends. I had friends in junior high school. I remember we had this table in the lunchroom where all of us sat together and we talked about hints and tips and tricks like i learned how to to beat the lasers in the caves of space quest one <laughs> from my friend jesse who was like oh yeah you need a piece of glass from the uh the ship way back there you know the one that you can't get back to i had to restore an earlier game and do all that again yeah. <laughs> where's your last save file man <laughs> but uh you know so remaking king's quest 3 at a time when my life and future was so uncertain was such a comfort it was like mm -hmm. working with an old friend who was like you know what everything's gonna be all right and I, and I was doing i was i was achieving that dream like i'd always wanted to make games and i gave up on that you know after that disastrous you know course i had there i, I just kind of went in other directions in life and i i circled back to this and all of a sudden you know things things might have been bad in one way but in another way i was living the dream and i was making this game with people from all over the world me mm -hmm. you know a little nobody from syracuse new york you know the smack dab in the middle of new york state central new york nothing where the biggest thing we have here is uh, salt potatoes <laughs> salt <laughs> potatoes did you make any games any other games between that and the remake of space quest 2 because i guess that was what probably five years later yeah yeah um well space quest 2 was in production uh, when we uh, were wrapping up King's Quest 3, uh, one of the other guys on the team, uh, uh, AJ, uh, he's from Nicaragua, he, uh, he had been working on that with Sean, and they, they, were, they were doing that, and I was finishing up a lot of the polish on King's Quest 3 and stuff, and doing the testing and the voices. And, and so, you know, we had that. Um, the thing about us, we probably started remakes of, like, 10 sierra games on on my hard drives there's about 10 half started <laughs> remakes of different sierra games you know like conquest of camelot uh, uh code name ice man let's see what else we got there um king's quest 4 king's quest 5 we were going to do a version of king's quest 5 that could run on modern computers and fix some of the dead ends and mm. um let's see what else do we have Codename uh, Iceman remake. That's pretty intriguing. You, what, yeah, would you do anything yeah. to have changed anything other than the graphic styling? Would you have made anything more, say, accessible for people? Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah, no. The, the, the sub simulator part, honestly, would have been out. <laughs> yeah. Like really, like you know, I I understand that it was a novel idea at the time for the company, 
mm-hmm. and they were trying to combine genres and games, but it did it did not work. It did not. Oh, you go from sexy on the beach down uh, to like, what the hell is happening here? Yeah. And how do I get out of this sub? Right. So. I mean, that's just Sean and I, and, and we, we still do that to this day. What's the, oh yeah, a Black Cauldron remake we had in the works. Ooh. And then we were like, we, we were like, we better not touch this. This is friggin' Disney. They'll eat us. Yeah. So. A- any hope for a Manhunter uh, remake? Oh, that's another one we started. That's true. Yeah, we had. Oh we yeah, had she little... started that one. Get that done, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, do that, please. Uh, I would love to, but um, I talked to the, the, the Murray brothers and sisters uh, and mm. everywhere mm. Uh, a few years back when we were doing that. And um, they were really cool and you know about that, but they were saying that they, they might want to pursue it themselves, you know, right. God, this was, this was like, this was like 10 or 12 years ago. So yeah. I, come on, yeah. guys, get on. The last I heard they mentioned it was in an interview in 2011 when I was looking it up for a previous episode. Right. Right. So it's, you know, and uh, so I, I didn't want to touch that with uh, without them. But uh, I love Manhunter uh, 1 and 2. Uh, mm-hmm. I particularly love 2. I spent a lot of time playing Manhunter 2. I was obsessed with San Francisco at the time. So, mm. uh, you know, like uh, the Sea of the City that way. I mean, just what a great concept, though. And it was like, it was like gruesome and cool. And it had that, you know, kind of, it kind of had that almost Blade Runner-ish, you know, kind of aesthetic to it, you know, which is like now seems overdone, but mm-hmm. at the time there wasn't much of that kind of stuff out there, you know? So, yeah, um, so we had, you know, a bunch of that. And the Space Quest 2, we were like, we should we should remake this because, um, you know, AGDI had, had started one but totally canceled it. And, you know, we loved Space Quest and we're like, all right, let's, let's do this. So we did and... Um, we uh we had started um a remake of space quest 3 and um you know we did like the whole first level of the garbage freighter of space quest 3 mm-hmm. like the whole thing and uh we had design work done for uh the other parts of the game but we you know we decided to cancel that uh in favor of doing our own commercial project and we wanted to put our efforts into that so i recently put the uh the whole first level of space quest three onto our space quest two remake and our version 2.0 release uh it's hidden in there as an easter egg if you find a couple of conditions at the end Mm -hmm. of the game you can play the whole first area of space quest three that we did that's lovely what what are those conditions like give us some spoilers here how do you how do you get to that uh, how do you access space quest three well you have to examine a lot like there's so many things to like examine lick look at and touch in space quest 2 you know mm-hmm. we took a lot of time to put in those interactions and so uh there's a couple uh, in the game you know, uh, places that you either look at lick or whatever you know they're that are a little off the beaten path and if you hear um the tones from the space quest 3 theme it, it means you've gotten one of the points you need to get three to activate mm. it, it goes is there more than three of them like for example is there nine hidden but you only need to find three of them or is there like no there are three there, five. there are five okay. so you okay. have to find three yeah. of the five that's fair there's no way i'm giving up my secrets on you know to, <laughs> to, to, to any of the gaming world that might be listening you guys gotta find it explore <laughs> it was worth a shot it's not hard it's really not hard to do once you find it and people have found it like I've oh, gotten really? emails and, and yeah, I've gotten emails and messages from people that said, "Oh, I found the Space Quest Three Easter egg. It's awesome. Thank you so much." And you know <laughs> that you know that makes that makes me happy. You yeah, know, like yeah, you know, honestly, if I could, I'd remake every every game. You know, like I always joke, I'm like, I gotta win the lottery because if I win the lottery, then I'm just gonna remake every game, and I don't care. I'm mm-hmm. gonna spend all the money on it. You know, <laughs> I'll pay for it. You know, I would love to do more remakes if I could, but mm-hmm. you know, you can only do so many. So uh, how do you compare the experience between uh, remaking a favorite classic and uh, coming up with your own game? Oh, man. Well, you know, coming up with your own thing, you know, whenever you create something, it's literally the sum of your influences. I mean, it it really is, you know. I mean, like, Mm -hmm. you know, you're tapping into traditions of storytelling that are thousands of years old. And, you know, you're you're putting what you like – and what 
entertains you into a form that other people can digest and, and share the experience with you. So, you know, we, obviously quest for infamy is influenced by quest for glory. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I've never tried to shy away from that. Like, honestly, it, it, Quest for Infamy is, you know, mine and Sean's love letter to Quest for Glory. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we we love, we love your game so much that we're making, you know, like a, a spiritual companion to it, you know, uh, where you play like, you know, a roguish character, you know, like he's not evil. Like people make that mistake. He's not evil. He's like Han Solo. You know, he's <laughs> uh, a little, you know, you know, a foul of the law but generally has a good, you know, is a good guy, but it doesn't mean that he won't do some underhanded things to get what he needs to do done, you know? Mm-hmm. So that was, that was the thing. And, you know, that was a little different than being just like the, the, you know, the, the hero and goody two shoes, your hero. And, you know, which is nothing wrong with that. We just wanted to give a different experience. And so creating that from the ground up, Oh boy, man. I mean, just like working on the story. Like I wrote the story, in chunks and bits, you know, I decided where uh, I wanted it to go and what to do. And then, you know, how, how do we leave a game in there? You know, like what kind of things can you do in it? You know, what kind of puzzles, what kind of objectives, you know, like how do you make it flow from what it, it, there was a lot of writing, a lot of charts, a lot of flow charts, you know, uh, a lot of That's what I was wondering. It must be hard making a cerebral puzzle-based adventure game. I mean, what do you do? Do you use like the typical puzzle ideas that uh, the masters have used? Have you come up with any of your own puzzles? Yeah, you know, I mean, I I try to, you know, I try to, you know, do a lot of classics in there. You know, in Quest for Infamy, there's, you know, a lot of fetch quests. There's, But, you know, we try to make them fun and part of the game, you know, so like, where your fetch quest experience would be, you got to explore some really cool things and see some like little side quests within that fetch quest, you know, like, so it wasn't just like walking here, getting something and walking back, you know, but like it made it part of it. And, you know, then we had you know, like puzzles, uh, you know, we had, um, there's like a peg jumping game puzzle in the game. There's a, a, a solving and matching runes kind of game, you know, just, um, you know, things that we knew had worked in other games and we tried to put our spin on them and, and try to do that. And But, you know, like working on puzzles was always like a collaborative thing. You know, Sean and I did that. And if anybody else on the team had an idea about something, we would work on it and develop it and, and, and come around. And I think that's the good thing about, like, that's what I love about collaboration and working on teams, right? Because no man is an island. I mean... I wrote the basic story to quest for infamy and the, you know, the ideas, you know, were like my story and everything, but that game is the product of everybody who worked on it. You know, the artists, so many artists in the game, Jason lamb, one of them, he came up with so many ideas for the game that ended up in there. And it was purely because it was his ideas, you know, and he was an adventure game fan and, and he had ideas for that. And I think that that's so important in making a game is, is that, it's good to collaborate with everybody. Like, it's great to have leadership. So you, you know, you gotta have, you gotta have leadership. You gotta have somebody say, all right, the buck stops here. You know, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to go in. And sometimes you have to make those hard decisions, but you should always leave development open to possibility. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's where a lot of teams also go wrong too, is like, they get a little too democratic. They're like, right. well, everybody gets to say it like that. But you know, then you have the too many, too many cooks problem, you know? Mm-hmm. And you can't you can't solve it. You got to have a head chef. Yeah. So, well, speaking of uh, puzzle design, uh, how do you find or uh, how do you um, gauge the uh, the balance between having a puzzle that's challenging to solve but not entirely out there moon logic, like something that's challenging but still something that can be um, uh, that is solvable? Yeah, man, that's tough because. You know, you'll design a puzzle and you'll you'll think of it one way and you're like, oh, you know, like everybody's going to think of it that way. And then somebody plays it and they do something you didn't think of and you're like, mm-hmm. oh, oh, crap, I got to <laughs> I got to change that. And I, I think that's what was nice about, um, you know, uh, our indie dev, dev, you know, like we had people playing and testing constantly as we went. So, I mean, we could we could change and do that. But, you know, we spent so much time trying to ensure that there were no dead ends in quest for infamy, you know, like there mm-hmm. and alternate puzzle solutions. Like I love alternate puzzle solutions. Like, right. Like if there is mm-hmm. three or four different ways to do something in the game, 
that's awesome because then you can play the game, you know, uh, over and over and get like different results, you know, like, like in quest for infamy, honestly, for most of the larger things, there are three or four solutions to things. There are things in quest for infamy that people have not discovered yet after six years. Like oh. we put so much crap in there. <laughs> Like, like r- ridiculous. Like this, nobody could ever make a game like that again, especially not for the budget we did it for. Like, right. Every, everybody worked on this game for peanuts, you know, and only for the love of it. It was really made for the love of the genre. And uh, I don't think, you know, we could ever do that again. You know, all of us, we're all older now. You know, we have families and responsibilities and, you know, all that crap. Yeah. <laughs> Just got right in there in the right time. Now, uh, I guess my other question for you is, uh, how have you found marketing a niche product such as adventure games? I'm guessing you started with your own fan base from when you were uh, originally doing the remakes, but how did you build on that? Oh, boy, let me tell you something. Marketing is, is so tough. Uh, you know, at one point I thought I knew something about it, but I don't. I don't know <laughs> crap. I don't, know. I don't know. You know, like, and that's the thing, you know, like, <clears throat> you know, Quest for Infamy made us no money, but we do have a good solid fan base, but, you know, we just didn't sell enough copies to, to recoup cost on the game and, you know, and pay that. Like, that's, you know, that's another thing, you know, that people don't realize that, you know, I mean, they just don't sell the numbers that, you know, other games do. And, and at the price point too, you know, like people are generally only willing to pay 10 to 15 bucks for uh, an adventure game these days. That's right. And, and, you know, and that's okay, you know, but uh, you do have to realize that at that price point and, you know, budget wise and money wise, you're just not going to get games that are as good. You know, I mean, uh, you know, Wajidai consistently makes great games for really good budgets and, you know, uh, that and, you know, like even, you know, Dave Gilbert from Wajidai, uh, he and I are friends, you know, we, we hang out and, uh, we see each other a couple times a year. Uh, I was down in New York City earlier this year, and we stopped off at his apartment to hang out for a bit, my wife and I. Oh, cool. And uh, he's come up to Syracuse and hung out with me. So, you know, he's always talking. He's like, he's like, I don't know, how, I don't know what I'm doing in marketing. He's like, I just, he's like, I just buy some ads on on Twitter and and you know, and I get retweets and pizza, you know. But he's got good word of mouth now, and word of mouth is everything in yeah. the adventure game community. Yeah, I mean, people still. Uh, you know, to this day, people will uh, ask for adventure game recommendations, and the Blackwell series will always get mentioned, right? Yeah, because they're great. You know, yeah. like they're, they're they're just good games. You know, like all of his all of his games are are really good. But he's worked really hard for years, you know, to to build that. And um, you know, for Quest for Infamy, you know, we um we we partnered with Phoenix Online Publishing for that. They published us on Steam. At the time, it was harder to get on Steam, and, and uh, I didn't have to go through Project you know, Greenlight or whatever with Steam if I went with the Phoenix. So we went with them, and they had um, they had uh, a couple marketing guys that were working to try to market their games because they had you know Jane Jensen's game that they were selling, and um, you know it was a it was a big deal. So we were kind of in on that, and we got their marketing guy, who is this uh, uh, man named uh, Mario Kroll, who is just lovely. Mario is like the best guy in the world and he has remained friends with me uh and sean through since that you know for six years now and you know tight and uh then mario met my wife at uh pax east a few years ago and they became friends so like they they still chat mario's just like the best guy and and he really helped us out with quest for infamy and getting word out and he uh he did publicity and uh and advertising for uh uh, order the thorn for free for us because he liked us so much he's like oh, you guys are you got no money he's like but i can do this you know so oh wow so, that's so great. You know, well you know i mean that's you know it pays to make friends you know i mean mm-hmm. i've got a lot of friends out there and i i like that I, that's another thing i love about this is i've made so many friends in the adventure game community and like I, like good friends like good people that i care about from all over the world like it's it's incredible like <laughs> there really are there's just so many people out there that uh you know i i care about and the, who care about me and it's mm-hmm. like how, how does this happen you know <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's crazy so you know uh marketing a game an adventure game is is tough especially they just they don't sell as much as they used to 
they find an audience, you know, and that's the thing. What's nice though is the Quest for Infamy was released in 2014, right? That's mm-hmm. six years ago, and people are still buying it. And I'm still getting emails saying, I just discovered this. This is awesome. I've been looking for something like this for years. How come I didn't find this before? You know? Mm-hmm. And I, I love also, getting those emails. Love it. I see you have uh, an art book and strategy guide. Is that something that's still available for people to pick up? Yeah, actually, you can get that on Amazon. Uh, cool. Amazon always says that they have one copy left, right? <laughs> it's because it's 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 because it's a print on demand book. When you order it from Amazon, they print it up and ship it out to you. Right. So, Ooh. and it's it's cool. It's an old school. You know, it's got uh, the old red reveal hint section, but it also has full maps, walkthroughs. Uh, we have charts in there for the enemies and all their their health and their your weaknesses and their you know all the every item you can get and like what they what it does like it, like it was extensive like we did a, like that book man i had a blast making that mm. um james broom you know one of the other guys who was basically a co-founder of uh, of infamous adventures with us he he's been with us from the beginning like he sean and i were like the three who started it and broomy was 14 when he started <laughs> wow. wow so yeah, it, he's British, though. <laughs> oh, he was already a grown-up then at 14. <laughs> you know, a British 14 is, you know, an American 32, so. <laughs> mm-hmm. Fair enough, yeah. Right. But, uh, no, he's a great guy. He's getting married. Uh, well, he was supposed to be getting married, like, now. <laughs> oh, and, no. Uh, yeah, they had to cancel yeah. because oh. of uh, the pandemic, so. They're postponed. It. They're going to do yeah. it again later. Yeah. But uh, I, I love Broomy like a brother. Like, yeah, Sean and Broomy, like, yeah, they're like brothers to me. And mm-hmm. I love that. Like, I got, you know, I got men, you know, that, that uh, I love like brothers, uh, uh, you know, on totally different continents. Yeah. So. <laughs> I think you mentioned at one point, because uh, I asked you about a uh, big box uh version of um quest for infamy and you said that was uh that was available at one time for uh, backers early on yes we we uh as a kickstarter reward we had a, a big box package and oh boy let me tell you something those have been uh i i'm disappointed in myself because that's the one thing that has been lacking in our kickstarter campaign is that i i still haven't gotten all those boxes out yet Oh no! Uh, yeah, the, like I have, a, I there's a ton of them sitting in my basement, and uh, it was still waiting to go out to people. And it's just because, um, you know, uh, I think I foolishly kind of assumed that I'd be able to have somebody else do it and outsource it, and, and you know, we couldn't. So, and it got too much for me. I mean, I, I'm one person, and they're in my house, and and I, I was doing them over the years, and I was sending out more, but then my kidney started to fail again, my second kidney transplant, and mm. uh, I got really sick, and, you know, uh, my time, you know, feeling well, and then I'm on dialysis four hours every other day, and, you know, and dialysis makes you feel like crap. It's just not a good thing, so I still have a ton of boxes that I still need to send out, and uh, I, I'm, I hope that after this pandemic thing ends, maybe I can get... Uh, you know, I got I got some young cousins. I'm thinking I can hire for a few days to help me finish boxing those up and sending those out because I want people to get their stuff, man. You know, yeah, I really of wish, course. I really wish I did. You know, I really wish we were a bigger company. You know, that had a a big revenue stream there where you know I could hire a, a separate division to take care of this because I make video games, man. I don't I don't make packages and send them out. <laughs> you know, like that's not mm-hmm. what I'm good at. So, uh, you know, that's one thing that I learned. Uh, if you're doing a, a Kickstarter, go easy on the physical merchandise because you will screw yourself so hard on that. Right. If if you want to do it, do it later, you know, and, and sell them one by one and make sure that you can fulfill those. Like, make sure. So, yeah, I mean, I yeah. still have a ton of big boxes and there there will be uh, some left over after I get them out to uh, everybody. But I'm just hesitant to sell them online until I finish getting out all the boxes to people who have already paid for them years ago and deserve yeah. them, you know? No, of course, of course. So after I do that, I, I should probably have something to sell. So was that, uh, so that was Quest for Infamy was uh, at least partially funded by Kickstarter? Yeah, it was, it was okay. partially funded by Kickstarter. We raised about, um, after taxes and, uh, and, uh, fees, uh, about, uh, uh 
forty-seven thousand, and then uh, I, I put uh, about uh, ten or twelve thousand dollars of my own money into the project, mm -hmm. which they say you should never do. But this was a passion project. This was of the course. dream game. I, this was the dream game I always wanted to make ever since I was a little kid. So you know what's. You know, I'm already in medical debt up to my eyes because of all the transplants and dialysis and everything like that. So, mm -hmm. what's another twelve thousand dollars? You know, like I, I, when we did it, I had big hopes. I had big hopes that we would make money on the, the project, and you know, I could pay myself back and do that. But I'm still in debt from Quest for Infamy. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I am still in debt. But you know what? It's worth it. Yeah, mm. screw it. Worth it. <laughs> uh. And the, uh, I believe, uh, I'm not sure how big this project is at the moment, but uh, you're working on Frog Sheen, which is a bit of a change of pace. Yes. Um, it, you know, it's it's small. There's just um, a couple people that are working on it. It started out as a joke, really, um, between um, a, a friend of mine uh, on Twitter who goes by the handle of Wilco Web. Uh, and, uh, you know, we talked about how much we loved Super Mario Brothers 2. Mm -hmm. Because it was so different from Super Mario Brothers 1, you know, and because it was a completely different game, it was originally a, a Japanese game called Doki Doki Panic. That's right. right? And, um, you know, we said, geez, you know, like, that game should get a proper sequel, you know, because the rest of the games pretty much kind of went back to the formula that Super Mario Brothers 1 established with, you know, little bits of things from Super Mario Brothers 2, but like, you know, so we we're like, what would a, what would a sequel to that be like? And we started making up our own thing, and then it just turned into its own game. So it started out as kind of a an, uh, a what if, and but now it's its own thing, and it's it's a lot of fun because I have fond memories of sitting around playing games like that too, and I've always wanted to do this. So you know, there's um right now we've got uh, uh I'm working on the design and some of the coding, but the the main coder is this uh this kid from Canada named Sam, who's a uh, just wonderful. I met him online and, uh, you know, we were started talking and I started telling him ideas. He just started working on it and he created all the game physics and, and the basics of the engine and just nailed it. Like he, it's, it's great. And then, uh, he, uh, he had a friend online who was a programmer who's come on board too. And, uh, uh, Gilbert, he's great. And, uh, and then Kevin does the graphics, uh, Wilco web. He does the graphics. So that's just, just us. We work on it when we can, you know, in our spare time, and uh, you know, uh, you know, as, as time allows and uh, and, and budget allows, you know, because I only have, you know, so much. Like we, 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 we earn a little money from Patreon, so I use that to, to pay those guys for you know, doing programming and stuff like that. And, you know, but they have you know a stake in the game, and we're going to try to get it released on you know Nintendo Switch and playstation 4 as well as you know pc steam and everything like that so it's you know it's just it's just another part of living the dream you know mm -hmm. I'm gonna ride this train as far as i can so that's a good time for games like that since we have so many platforms and, and it's great how the switch has really been a boon to all sorts of different genres and games that uh, people wouldn't yeah. expect it's crazy you know i mean we're working actually on a port for quest for infamy to the uh, switch oh Ooh. perfect yeah, um, I got approached by a developer who who's been uh, porting AGS games to the Switch and was interested in doing that. I said, "Yeah, let's do it." Yeah. So uh, I'm 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 excited because uh, <laughs> I get to play. I want to play my game on the Switch. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe like it. It was cool playing my own games on a PC, but like yeah, playing my own games on a Nintendo. Plus, like you know, uh, within my family, you know, not everybody uh, you know kind of understands or played the games that I did, right? My, my cousin Connor, uh, who uh, absolutely loved Quest for Infamy, like he still talks about it, plays it to this day. And there was a couple other my cousins who got it and played it, but uh, you know, like most of them don't understand what I do or like that. But they understand Nintendo and they have Nintendos. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I I think this is kind of fun that way that like I can get more of my family involved in what I'm doing because I have a huge family too, by the way, right. like not. Like, not just my immediate family. My my mother is one of nine children. So, and they all have kids. And all of us cousins, we all grew up together. So, like, my cousins are, you know, like brothers and sisters to me. So, we're, we get together all the time, you know, and you know, we get family gatherings are like 100 people large. So, 
So uh, mm. I, I would like more of them to be able to see what I do and understand it. Have uh, you ever thought of going back and doing a, a commentary for a question? for infamy i know i'm playing a blackwell legacy and they've done a they've done a first commentary and then dave gilbert did a five years later commentary where he, he did some tweaks and and gave some of a perspective on it yeah you know um we've uh, we've thought about that i mean i would love to sit there and do that with sean it's just you know finding time to do that these days and it's a it's a huge game like honestly there's so much in quest for infamy i'm working on the version 2.0 of it now and I'm looking through all the, the the locations and all the code and all this stuff, and I want to go back and punch 2013 Steve in the nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Way too ambitious, but it turned out. It turned out. I think it turned out awesome. I like it. I'm 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 proud of our game. I'm, mm. I, it's got a lot of. Let me tell you, that game has a lot of heart in it. It's got a lot of. <laughs> It's got a lot of stupid, dirty jokes in it, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's got a lot of it's got a lot of action and adventure, and you know, it's just it's just a honestly, it's a silly, fun, adventurous game, and I'm glad that I made it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the character portraits in Quest for Infamy uh, are they based on real people, or are they all just dr- uh, drawn by an artist? They're drawn by uh, an artist, Jenny Pattison. What what I would do is I would say to Jen, I would be like, I kind of imagine this guy looking a little like. Uh, Jason Statham meets, uh, you know, this, and she would, she would do it based on that. And, um, you know, like there's, there's definitely some, like some people, like I remember there's a character of Valeris and, uh, and I said, I said, I kind of see Valeris, uh, looking a little like Jennifer Connelly. So, you know, you can see a little bit of that in there. I think there's a little bit of Winona Ryder in her too. Mm. It was, you know, all up to Jen's artistic interpretation. She did all of them. And uh, actually, all the the character portraits she did at high resolution too. You know, it's a low res yeah. game, so that so I have all these high res, you know, original portraits that she did that are just gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they look. Uh, I I could swear some of them uh, could have been uh, drawn over like a real photograph because they looked. Uh, they're, they're, the character art really impresses me in that game, along with a lot of other things like a lot of the backgrounds and such like that. But I just know that the. Uh, uh, I, I really had to ask about the portraits because I really wasn't sure which way it was. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's just Jenny. She's just talented. Like, honestly, if you look her up, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, her website is www.jenpatterson.com. Uh, look at her portfolio. Like, she's just – like, we lucked out with her. When she came on with us, she came on with us at Infamous Adventures and did a few things – she was a student uh, in art school studying animation and everything like that and uh, was doing beautiful work on that. And she loved Sierra games and wanted to work with us. And she came on with us for Quest for Infamy and, uh, you know, for the, all the rest of our games. And, like, she's legit. Like, she's pro, pro now. She works for Disney. She's worked for uh, – other uh, large game companies, Ubisoft and, and you know things like that, but she still comes back and does little things with us because she, she's our friend. You know, she's like, she, we we were her start. <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. I'm kind of proud of of her. You know that she got her start with us and she went on to do stuff like she she yeah she worked on a Disney TV series that was on YouTube or something for a while. So I mean, like, how cool is that? You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's great. Oh, I've just uh, brought up her web page here. I can see some of the characters she's designed. I can see the influence of, of Quest Games, King's Quest, and, and other things in her art, too. That's uh, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah nice she's great. That she's done. Looks like you have uh, at least 40, 50, 60. How many NPCs do you have in, in this? There's so many people to meet in the oh, game. Oh, there's like 120 NPCs. Oh, oh wow. wow. Not all of them have portraits, but a mm-hmm. great number of them do. Oh, mm-hmm. and you know, actually, um, I forgot. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, several of the portraits are based on real people. They were Kickstarter backers who backed right. at a certain level, and they got to be a character in the game. And uh, yeah, they had their 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 actual face in the game rendered by Jenny. So. Super cool. And I mean, so many rooms to put together. There's hundreds of rooms. I mean, different screens to explore and every screen has so much going on. I mean, it's it must be overwhelming looking back on it, like you said. Yeah, I I, uh, I usually have to take a Xanax before I look at the book. 
<laughs> <laughs> what I always talk about, what, what I would, I would love to do. I would love to, uh, demake, mm-hmm. uh, quest for glory six or five, sorry, five, quest for glory yeah. five, uh, make it, uh, in the style of the other games uh, and call it King's crown, the original name of the game. And, you know, I, uh, I would love to do that with Lori and Corey Cole, who uh, I have been fortunate to become friendly with over the past few years. Lori mm-hmm. and Corey have been so nice to, to me and to my family and to Sean and, and gracious. They check in on me all the time. And I was like, it, I, I, you know, yeah. If I could, I would be like, "Hey guys, let's let's just make a let's make an alternate uh, alternate <laughs> Quest for Glory five just for fun," you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Coles are great. I've had the wonderful pleasure of meeting them in person, and they're just uh, they're amazing people. Um, well, plus, plus, well, I mean, I like them, but they they work with this real. Oh God, she's awful. Uh, her name's you ever heard of her? Her name's Roberta. She's terrible. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, really, I just, I like, I just want to slap her. She's like mean. She calls me up and she's like, I hate you. And she, 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 she sends me, uh, she sends me dog, uh, poo in the mail. Like she mails me <laughs> petrified dog poo. It's awful. She's terrible. Let's all give a shout out against our vile enemy, Roberta, right now. Roberta, Roberta Vaughn. No. 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 <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> <Jeers>. <laughs> When she hears this, she's gonna kill me. <laughs> oh, I, I, okay, okay. I have to say for the record that, like, I, I love, love, love Roberta. Like, I want to buy Roberta an island in the Pacific and let her live there, you know, free and happy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I love. She's I love the Roberta. connecting thread through so many of us that know each other. If it weren't for her, so a lot many. of us wouldn't have connected. Yeah. You know, so. And she's just she's so genuine and she really means it you know when mm-hmm. she checks in on you and and wonders how you're doing or you know you, you, when she talks to me about something she's excited about you know like a project that she's working on and everything like that and I, I just i i love that kind of pure enthusiasm and joy for things because i mean i'm i'm very much the same way you know and mm-hmm. i just i appreciate that there's people out there like that so anyway Roberta, terrible, terrible person, terrible. <laughs> and her name's Roberta, too. Only stupid people are named Roberta. Never has a Roberta contributed anything to the adventure game industry. No. Yeah, Never heard of any important Robertas. Right? What has a Roberta ever done for us? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I'm just, now I'm just being silly. Outside of Frog Sheen, what other projects do you have on the go right now? Well, we do. Um, we are wrapping up Quest for Infamy, Rome to Ruin. That's a prequel to Quest for Infamy. It, it kind of shows the story of what happened to uh, Mr. Rome before he escaped to, you know, uh, the land, you know, where Quest for Infamy takes place. And uh, it's a smaller game, but I think it's a lot of fun, and uh, I really enjoy it. We did um, we did some interesting things in there. Like there's a there's a hidden object uh, game in there. Like there's a room where you have to steal a bunch of stuff, but you have to find it. It's like it's like hidden object style. Like we never did that before. That's kind of fun. And um, so uh, we're recording voices for that right now. And when that wraps up, we'll test it, and then we'll get it out. And um, then we're working on uh, the second part to Order of the Thorn, Fortress of Fire. And uh, I'm kind of excited about that because it really, it it finishes the story of the game. It wraps everything up and it ties together a lot of things that aren't necessarily apparent in the King's Challenge off the bat. Which, you know, brings me to the second point is, um, you know, like, we split the order of the thorn into uh it was going to be three parts and um you know now you know um, we figure we can do it in two you know for budgetary reasons and everything like that and uh, like like order of the thorn was not as popular as quest for infamy and did not sell as much so but um i think i want to release uh fortress of fire not only as a standalone game but i want to release Order of the Thorn is one whole complete long game, and I think that it'll be released like that in addition, like it's an, it's an alternate version you can get. 
So, uh, because there's a lot of things that tie back into what happened in the King's Challenge that make a little more sense and are revealed a little bit more in the second part. So I'm excited about that. Okay, great. Um, so just as we come time to wrap things up a bit, is there anything else you'd like to throw in or any uh, shout outs you'd like to give? Uh, uh, I'd like to give shout outs to literally everybody on Twitter who follows me uh, yes. because uh, I have a great Twitter following and everybody on there is, is amazing. Uh, I got to give a shout out to my uh, infamous adventures and infamous quest teams. I am literally nothing without those people, and I love them dearly. Uh, I love all you people at you know the uh, <laughs> the gamers guild here. Uh, you know, it's so funny. There's like so many people that like I get nervous about every day that I don't like tell people enough that like I'm so thankful for them and thankful for what they do. You know, because but but I am. And, you know, uh, my health isn't great right now. You know, I'm waiting on another kidney transplant. I'm on dialysis and it sucks. But, you know, we're in the middle of this pandemic. But I am so blessed. Literally, people say it all the time. But I, but I am. I got to do my dream job. I got to make my dream game. I get to be friends with people from all over the world. Uh, and my stupid little game has made the difference in other people's lives people have sent me emails tell, talking about how much they loved my game and how it changed their life for the better and it made them better it, you know it cheered them up in a in a dark time in their lives and like i i did that you know who who would have thought that i'm you know, i'm so lucky you know mm -hmm. like it's it, it's it's beyond i get a little emotionally overwhelmed about it. i'm an emotional guy sue me you know so uh i'm thankful to everybody who continues to contribute to infamous quests and believes in what we do and it's important to them. And, uh, I'm just going to keep doing it as long as I can. And, uh, you know, that's it. Well, we're really glad of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we're really grateful for you taking the time to uh, come on the show. Finally, it's, it's been a great pleasure chatting with you and uh, we wish you all of the best and only the best in the future. Well, thank you very much. It has been my pleasure. It's great to talk to you guys. This was awesome. I had a great time. Let's do it again. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll schedule a time coming up soon to have you back oh, on yeah, the show. Like we'll two talk years about... from now, dude. Two yes, years. Yes, exactly. Two years. <laughs> Another two years. Yeah. We'll, we'll plan for next week, and it'll happen two years from now. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's a great idea. <laughs> uh, well. Um, uh, to the rest of you listening out there, uh, you know where to reach us. We're on Facebook. We have a page. We have a group. We're on Twitter at the CG Guild. We are sometimes, but not really, on Instagram at CGG Podcast. Uh, we have a Patreon. Uh, you can find us there, Classic Gamers Guild. And we have an email if you want to send us any questions or comments or hate mail. Uh, those will be sent to me, so just make sure to direct all your hate towards me. Um, that's mail at classicgamersguild.com. And uh, thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next week. And Anna, any final words? Always make a new save file. <laughs> so good. <laughs> so good. Correct. <laughs>